All right. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining. My name is Lucia Pasternak. I'm the Catholic Campus Minister here at Kane. I'm assigned here by the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Newark um, to minister to the students and provide some programming and events. Uh, and I also help advise the uh, Catholic Newman Club, the student work on campus. I do want to give a chance for our some of our interfaith uh, council members to introduce themselves. Uh, I see Rachel, Dara, Muhammad, um, and then one of these Sarahs must be um, our Sarah from the Interfaith Council if she wants to introduce herself as well. Um, but if anyone from the Interfaith Council just wants to kind of introduce themselves so that way we know who you are. I'll go. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, I'm Rachel Malaga. Um, I am the Hillel advisor for Kane. Uh, so I serve the Jewish students on campus. I'm part of Hillel of Greater Metro West New Jersey. So we work with six campuses um, in like central ish New Jersey. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adara Goldberg. I am the director of the Holocaust Resource Center and the Diversity Council on Global Education and Citizenship here at Kane, and it has been a real pleasure to work with my colleagues on bringing interfaith programming and resources to the Kane community. And we are so grateful to have the three of you here today to illuminate your experiences and insight onto this topic. So thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Quigendall. I'm the Assistant Director of the Holocaust Resource Center and Diversity Council at Kane University. Um, I also help everyone with developing the programming for uh, Interfaith Council. And I'd also like to share that this program was made possible due to Kane University receiving an Interfaith America grant for the 2022-23 academic year. So thank you all so much for joining us. And I look forward to tonight's program. My name is Mohammed Hassan. I'm the executive director of Learning Commons, and I'm glad to be on this council. I think that was all of our professional staff on the Interfaith Council, if I'm correct. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. So I just want to do a little introduction. If you're new to the Interfaith Council and who we are, um, the Interfaith Council is composed of faculty, staff, and students and community members. Um, who are interested in helping the Kane community grow an understanding of different religious traditions. Um, what we do is we work with the Office of DEI, as well as other campus departments um, and uh, clubs and orgs on campus to create educational material and events and programming uh, surrounding different religious traditions. Um, we believe that religious difference serves as a bridge of cooperation between people rather than a barrier to division. And if that is something that interests you, then you are in luck because you can join the Interfaith Council. Anyone's welcome to join. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about interfaith initiatives, you can put into the Zoom chat in this event today um, your Kane email address, maybe, and I can add you to our newsletter. Um, the Interfaith Council sends out a periodic newsletter on different things that we have going on throughout the year. Maybe we highlight different um, traditions or holidays and things going on for some of the different faiths that are represented on campus. Um, so if that interests you, send in your uh, your Kane email address. Um, but I'm going to pass like the virtual microphone over to Muhammad because he is going to introduce our panelists today. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining and being here. Thank you, Lucia, for giving, the, giving me the virtual microphone. So uh, I think uh, what I will do is I will pass it on to our speakers and we'll start from Dr. Bolito. If you could let us know about your name, position, affiliation, and how your day look like within your faith community. Hi, so I'm Dr. Christopher Bolito. I'm a professor of history um, at Kane. Uh, I've been at Kane since 2004, and um, you know, a, a, a day, I don't know whether I could talk about a day in the life of all Christians or Catholics, uh, or a, a day in my life, so I'm going to talk about a day in my life. Um, though I am a practicing Catholic, a practicing meaning I'm trying to get it right uh, and realize that I won't. Uh, I would say that my experience of Catholicism is, as the, the worldwide experience of Catholicism has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. It's gone from being um, extremely top-down and centralized to increasingly decentralized and vernacular. Catholics used to go to mass uh, about 60 years ago in Latin, um, despite what any of them will tell you. Most of them did not know what was going on. And uh, now we go to mass uh, typically on Sundays, but also daily. 
uh, if some people wish, in, in your own language. And having done some travel around the world and having attended masses, it can be uh, remarkable. The difference of that can be uh, really quite remarkable. Um, I think that, that, that Catholicism and Christianity in general, and Catholicism in particular, I, I kind of nobody does ritual like us. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a bragging sense. I mean that we have lots of smells and bells. Um, and if you saw the uh, 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 media, the, the, the video commentary, the video exposure of the uh, Benedict XVI's, the former Pope's funeral, you get a, you get a kind of a, a sense of that. I, I would say that in the last 50 years, a lot has changed since a big council took place 60 years now between 1962 and 1965 called Vatican II which really kind of revolutionized the church and, and put it in a much more comfortable relationship with the world as opposed to the world as something to be feared. And that um, because of that, Catholicism is really catching up to what um, my Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters have been doing for centuries, which is really bringing the faith out to the community. Not that Christianity hasn't done that, but Christianity has had a much a much less comfortable relationship with, with the community. And so there's a, there's a much greater, I think, interest in social justice um, that's growing. Thank you, Dr. Bolito. Uh, next on my screen is Monar Rizwan. Hi, my name is Sayyid Rizwan Rizvi. I come from a religious background. My father, late Sayyid Tilmiza Stan Rizvi, served here in New Jersey community for almost 35, 40 years as an imam and um, I've been privileged to be part of the Central Jersey um, Mosque uh, Muslim Foundation which was founded back in 1998 and I've been part of this uh, uh, institution since 2012. Um, prior to that I was uh, in Boston for a few years and prior to that I served uh, on the west coast for a short while. Uh, my primary education was done in Middle East, um, in Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, that's where the Islamic seminaries are, um, the, the Shia Islamic seminaries in particular. Um, my typical day, well, you know, we're like doctors on call 24-7. And uh, sometimes it's hectic, sometimes it could be easy going, but uh, we have... Uh, weekly programs. Uh, and um, while well, doctors said, you know, there are a lot of rituals in, in their faith. Uh, and um, we believe we have a lot of rituals as well. Um, so, you know, there not goes by a day that you're not doing some sort of Islamic ritual. Uh, you know, just take the five time prayers that happens uh, now. Um, of course, you have a choice to pray at home, but you can definitely join the mosque and pray there. So we offer that on a daily basis at our mosque. Um, then we have a you know program on Fridays basically, which is the Friday prayer main event uh, all across Muslim world, uh, where they have in the, at noon time they have this prayer with sermons, uh, sort of like you know the mass and the service Christians have on on Sunday. So our Jewish brothers took Saturday, Christian brothers took Sunday. We were left with no other weekend, so we took Friday to be that and. Um, um, jokes aside, you know, yes, uh, day pretty much goes by uh, dealing with community, uh, with their uh, counseling and issues, or sitting behind this computer or screen right here, um, doing conferences or Zoom calls. Uh, you know, now, of course, pandemic is behind us pretty much. Uh, I thought I was living down here in my basement for a couple of years. Uh, finally, things have gotten better and, you know, moving about and having things in person. I was really looking forward to coming to the, the campus and uh, doing this in person. But uh, unfortunately, with the weather last night, uh, had to be done online. So I'm looking forward to this event. Again, my name is Rizwan Rizvi. Uh, I uh, belong to the Somerset County Muslim Foundation, Masjid Ali. Thank you, Walter Rizwan. Next is Victor. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Victor Appel, and I'm the Associate Rabbi at uh, Temple Emmanuel in Westfield. Um, we are uh, a reform congregation. There are several denominations within Judaism. Ours is a reform congregation. Um, reform is a liberal uh, denomination. Um, it is uh, 
It was born in Germany um, in the early 1800s and is very much a product of both the Enlightenment uh, and the Reformation. So we um, uh, are a, a denomination that strives to maintain um, ancient traditions um, within the realm of a modern society. Um, uh, I've been a rabbi for 24 years now. Prior to being here, I was the reform rabbi and senior Jewish educator at um, Rutgers University's Hillel. Um, so um, what does my day look like? Um, I spend way too much time answering email. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But so today, um, as a typical day, I started it off with uh, a meeting with our senior rabbi. Um, from there, I uh, met with a congregant uh, for some pastoral uh, counseling, um, managed to squeeze lunch in somewhere, and then we had a staff meeting. And uh, in between, I tried to answer as many emails as I can. Um, and here I am now with all of you. And after this, I'll begin working on uh, planning our services for the weekend, our, our main services on Friday evenings, um, and we, then we have a variety of services on Saturday as well. Um, uh, sorry, we uh, took. Uh, sorry, we claimed Saturday before our Muslim siblings uh, could get to it. Uh, <laughs> so we our, our our Sabbath observances from Friday night through Saturday, um, and so um, the next couple of days I'll actually be kind of very involved in planning all of those services. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, so now, Lucia, is there anything else that you're going over? We are good to start off some questions. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for the introduction. Uh, now, just to lay down a couple of uh, items, housekeeping items, please, everybody, keep yourself muted. If you have a question, uh, please put that in the chat for now. Uh, we will open it up for questions from public uh, after the initial questions that we'll ask our uh, panelists. And each once I ask the question, any panelist can jump in. Uh, we have four questions, uh, or I believe four questions. I didn't take a look at it. Um, please answer it between two to five minutes, and then other uh, panelists can respond for from one to two minutes. And once we are done with our questions, we'll open it up to public. Should we start? All right, so the first question is, what are the challenges that interfaith dialogue presents? I guess I'll start because I'm unmuted, huh? <laughs> um, I'd like to begin with a verse from Quran. It's chapter 17, verse number 70. Uh, it says, and we have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them on the land and sea and provided for them the good things and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. Um, and I share this verse and similar verses exist in Quran in order to highlight some of the challenges that um, exist while we are um, living in a very diverse society and we could be facing, um, you know, and we should be aspiring to having more and more events like this. Uh, one of the obvious uh, challenges that interfaith um, you know, dialogue presents, as um, my other colleagues would uh, assert to it as well, as they have, I'm sure, been to many such um, programs. Um, you know, the difference in belief, of course, belief, of course, you know, we come from different backgrounds, and uh, the most significant challenge to interfaith dialogue is the vast differences in belief and practices that exist between different religions. Um, could also be the cultural differences and not all religions belong to a particular culture. So even just if you take Islam, you know, it has a variety of cultures, uh, although they all might subscribe to the same religion, but due to the cultural difference that they all come from. Another thing that could play a real, you know, vital role in it is the historical tensions um, and conflicts between different religions that can make it difficult for people to engage in a productive dialogue, uh, and these tensions can be, you know, um, exasperated by ongoing political or social conflicts that exist. Uh, stereotypes and prejudices, um, you know, about other religions can make it difficult for people to approach interfaith dialogue uh, with an open mind. And um, of course, overcoming these biases is essential 
for a productive uh, dialogue. Um, you know, and lastly, um, could be different goals. People come into such dialogues with different um, objectives. You know, someone come, might come here, for example, maybe seeking to learn and understand. And I hope that's the case with everyone here. I'm definitely here to learn and understand, while others may be seeking to, for example, defend their own beliefs or convert others. And, you know, these goals can create misunderstandings and tensions. Thank you. Uh, any other response? Rabbi, Dr. Belito? Well, um, I, I don't think I could say it any better than Rizwan just said it. Um, that was uh, so beautifully put. Um, I think that, we, and I agree with everything you said, I think that we often um, come or have historically, people have come to interfaith dialogue or con been concerned about interfaith dialogue because they weren't sure how they were going to be viewed or accepted um, or what the purpose of it was. Um, you know, for many um, uh, people who are Jewish, there's a concern that um, people are gonna try to convert them, right? And that that will be sort of the hidden agenda of interfaith dialogue. And so it's very often about convincing um, people that interfaith dialogue is actually, or should be a safe space. Um, and it's a great, you know, opportunity to learn about each other. And I think that, you know, historically, different communities have not always had the opportunity to be in proximity to each other. And so that led to a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings. Um, and that's always been a challenge to, to interfaith dialogue. Um, but I think now, um, hopefully, um, we're in a much different place and there's a much different uh, attitude with which we think about entering into interfaith dialogue. Thank you, Rabbi. Dr. Belito. So, uh, so when I teach ancient and medieval history, I always talk about the three monotheistic faiths, and students are amazed that they are that we are all children of Abraham. Um, and, and I explain very clearly that I'm not trying to make anyone Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, but in order to understand why Jerusalem is important to Muslims, I have to explain the night journey. Um, and, and I can give you many other examples of that. Uh, one of the things that I find on this campus that's delightful is, is the fact that we, we must encounter each other because of the incredible diversity. I grew up in the Bronx. I knew one Jew who lived next door because in my neighborhood, and I'm not kidding, they only let one Jewish family in. And I never spoke to a Muslim until my first year at NYU. I can't tell you whether that person was male or female because I don't remember. All I remember was thinking to myself, I've never spoken to a Muslim before. And so just daily encounter really helps. And, and I think that that's a, that's a grace um, of Cain just by dint of being um, Cain. Uh, Christians have a particularly difficult time with other religions because the, the notion of most Christians, and certainly not most, many Christians, excuse me, and certainly many Catholics, is ecumenism and interreligious dialogue goes something like this. I'm right, you're wrong, come back. Uh, and certainly that was the attitude of seminarians that I was teaching in the late 1990s. So there is this kind of triumphalism that you get in Christianity that you don't get, this kind of this cultural imperialism. It's historically grounded. Um, and, and kind of an us versus them mentality, which comes, as my colleagues have said, from ignorance, from fear, and from, um, from distrust. Thank you, and very well said. Um, the next question, I think some, some parts you have already answered, uh, but I'll still ask, what are the opportunities that interfaith dialogue presents? It's we're just going in the same order. <laughs> I don't want to be jumping before you guys. You're, uh, you know, you're seniors than me, and uh, senior in a sense that you're you're more experienced than me, and just don't want to. All right. So definitely, you know, this was covered uh, previously as well, but um, one of the opportunities that you know just this gathering right here uh does you know by sitting side by side and uh, it was meant to be in person but you know nonetheless virtually it's to build bridges right 
uh, we're able to um, bring ourselves together, bridge a gap, if possible, um, between our faiths, um, promote understanding, and uh, reduce misunderstandings and stereotypes that exist. You know, I I offer this uh, service in our mosque where Rutgers campus, uh, Riders University, and other um, high school campus, um, you know, that are in the neighborhood there, uh, and even Kane and others are more than welcome to do so. Invite them over uh, to our mosque um, any day of the year that they can choose. Um, come and in person experience being in the mosque. Um, and then, you know, we provide some um, uh, information, some brochure. And again, there's no purpose to convert or to defend or anything. It's just to um, enlighten them with the religion firsthand instead of just Googling something up or looking up online and seeing or hearing things here and there. So one thing that this interfaith dialogue does is to build bridges. Um, it, it, I think it should be one of the main focuses is to promote peace. Um, um, you know, to whatever extent you and I can. And of course, I'm sure we all do that in our um, in individual uh, congregations that we have on month and weekly basis, that this interfaith dialogue can be an effective tool for promoting peace and resolving conflicts between different religious communities, you know, by finding common ground and identifying uh, our shared values, um, people of different religions can work together to promote peace um, and understanding. Um, it can also serve to, you know, strengthen our communities um, by promoting tolerance or respect, uh, um, by working together and supporting one another, you know. Um, there are many other aspects, um, enhancing education, for example. Um, there are a lot of uh, these uh, classes that are offered in our mosque as well. Uh, to promote, um, um, you know, just this uh, um, learning uh, different faiths and religions, just from the aspect of knowing what what they have to teach, um, and I think more than the books, what the experience that you get being in 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 an environment with those people and speaking to them in person, I think that's really are some of the benefits of uh, uh, opportunities of interfaith dialogue. Thank you. Who's going next? Like Dr. Belito, I too am from the Bronx, <laughs> though I suspect we're from different neighborhoods because my neighborhood was overwhelmingly Jewish <laughs> um, and filled with many synagogues and kosher stores and, and the like. And that neighborhood now is probably uh, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in New York City, um, from what I understand. It's changed dramatically. So when I was growing up, it didn't really seem like we needed to know um, uh, much about people who were of other faiths because we didn't know people of other faiths. You know, all of our neighbors uh, were the same faith by virtue of where we lived. That world has changed dramatically. Um, and, um, and now, especially um, living in New Jersey um, and living in central New Jersey, we live in a wonderfully diverse uh, part of the world. Um, and so it it behooves us to learn who our neighbors are. Um, and to me, it makes life much more interesting when we know a little bit more about our neighbors and their lives and what they believe in. Um, I also think that there's great value to uh, learning about other um, religions so that we can support each other, right? Um, you know, uh, one of the things that we have found, Reform Judaism is very committed to social action and social justice. Um, we believe that we work in partnership with God to finish the work of creation. Um, and But one of the things that we've learned is that we cannot do that alone. Um, to finish that work of creation, um, to bring up about a time that we hope is worthy of uh, being called a messianic era, we must do that in partnership with others. Um, and it does not matter if those partners are Jewish or not. As long as we're all working for the same thing, that's what counts. We've also found um, <clears throat> that when uh, a community feels uh, or is under attack, it is wonderful to know that they have the support of their interfaith neighbors. Um, here in Westfield, we had a few incidences of anti-Semitism at our local high school. 
Um, and it was wonderful for us in the Jewish community to know that our interfaith partners here in town um, were there for us. Um, when there were threats against the Jewish community, um, some of the uh, Christian ministers in town came to our services to worship with us. Um, and both uh, uh, as, a, as a clergy person, I was grateful for my, the support of my fellow colleagues, but I can't tell you how much it meant to my congregation to know that we had the support of the interfaith community. Um, so there are times when, um, you know, interfaith dialogue really leads to showing up for each other. Um, and, and increasingly, that is something that we need to be able to do. And the way that we do that is by learning about each other, by breaking down the barriers that other people might erect. Um, and, and, and creating dialogues exactly such as this. I would, I would only add that, that um, I think since World War II, when, when we saw the extreme of the Shoah, um, I, I think people became so frightened of the degree to which re religion was co-opted by fundamentalisms, that's a plural, right? So, you, you could have socialism and then the fundamentalist of that, Democrat, Republican, and the fundamentalists of that fill in the blank with anything, right? Fundamentalisms is a problem, is that is that there was a switch that instead of talking about what separates us is the Venn diagram of what, what our three traditions talk about the common good. And it's striking how much overlap there really is and how much respect there already is. My students are amazed to hear that in Quran, there are more references to the verge to, to Mary, Jesus's mother, than there are in the Christian gospels um, by name. And that Jesus is a prophet in the Muslim tradition and that Jesus is Jewish. And therefore everyone you read about in the gospels is Jewish. And I think that, that it's an entirely different kind of mindset. And that interfaith dialogue begins with the, the we-ism as opposed to the me-ism that's, that's killing us as religions and is killing us, I would say, as uh, here, in the, here, in the United, here in the United States. Just one quick anecdote. So in April of 2019, um, a shooter in New Zealand went to two mosques in Christchurch, um, killed 51 people and wounded hundreds of others. By chance, I was there with my family two months later, um, teaching at the University of Canterbury. And there was this tremendous, exactly what the rabbi is saying, is that this rejection, because the shooter was Australian, who deliberately came to New Zealand, and, and invaded, and one person used the word, infected New Zealand. Um, and, and there was a real rejection of that to say, this is not who we are. And the, and the interfaith coming together was remarkable to see. I mean, we were living several blocks from one of the, one of the, mosque, uh, one of the mosque sites. So we tend to look at the damage and we should look at the damage but, you know, kind of what Mr. Rogers used to say, always look to the people running to help as well. When the people are running to help, you'll find there's Jews, there's Christians, there's Muslims, there's Hindus, there's Buddhists, and there's atheists as well. Very well put. And I think it, it, it dives down into our next questions. Question is, what, are, what role can young people, including students, I mean, we are all students, but young people, young students, play in promoting interfaith dialogue and interfaith understanding. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. And I guess um, I have not been in the, um, you know, university or college campuses teaching like um, um, my fellow brothers are, uh, and they'll be able to highlight more about it. But within our own community, what we've been able to do is that uh, involve, you know, young students, uh, young adults, um, we call them youth um, to to come forward because, of course, the energy that they possess and the elder congregation no longer has, and uh, they're not just about rituals. They're they're more pragmatic when it comes to some of the practices as well, and uh, and their minds are not as uh, 
um, stern, um, if that's the right word, um, it, you know, as someone who would be, you know, our age or older, for example. Um, so there, there's acceptance in them, um, and and there's less bias or prejudice in them than older folks. So understanding different religious beliefs, practices, and cultures is essential uh, for promoting, um, you know, interfaith dialogue, especially amongst the young, younger ones. Um, what they can also, um, you know, because of the savvy nature, um, their nature of being very savvy with, um, with the technology, um, young people can participate in these interfaith events, um, you know, prayer services, cultural festivals, uh, um, you know, can help build relationship and foster understanding between people of different religion. And of course, because of their savviness with this, um, this social media nowadays, it's very easy to promote many of these things, uh, you know, through their social circle that they have. Um, you know, while uh, we might give lecture to maybe 100 people or 200 people, but uh, have a wide variety and range, range to reach out to more and more people, you know, advocating for interfaith understanding. They can advocate um, by speaking out against intolerance and discrimination, um, promoting the value of diversity and inclusion. And this can be, again, as I said, done through social media, community events, um, and different forms of activism. Um, you know, overall, young people um, and our youth have an important role to play in, uh, in promoting interfaith dialogue and interfaith understanding. Um, first and foremost for themselves by learning about different religions, um, participating in different interfaith events, engaging in uh, service projects, and you know they will enhance their own knowledge and understanding and the concept of coexistence and um, you know, abiding with others, even if you don't follow what they're doing, but you still have that much, uh, your skin is thick enough to, to be able to go through if someone is doing certain things and that doesn't bother you um, because that's okay according to their faith. So I guess uh, from that end, they can definitely play a very important role in, in promoting this actually. I think that um, young people play a very important role in interfaith dialogue, largely because they're much smarter than we are. Um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, we, uh, I'll speak for myself, my generation, we were brought up to approach things like interfaith dialogue from a place of fear. Um, a younger generation today, I think, approaches it from a place of fascination. Um, they are I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to learn about each other, to compare and contrast their, their faith traditions um, and uh, to really dive into uh, what we all have in common. Um, so I think that young people play a very important role. Um, I see just in my, own, in my own congregation, our teens are um, very interested in learning about what other people do um, in terms of their, their faith, their belief in God, their, their ritual lives. Um, uh, they want to learn. There is a desire to learn. And when I worked at um, Hillel at Rutgers University, I found that the students of all faiths wanted to be able to sit down, break bread, and learn from and about each other. Um, and, and as I said, never from a place of fear, but always from a place of fascination. Um, and I think to me that that is such a hopeful sign um, that, uh, that they approach learning about different people and different religions in this way. Um, and uh, that's, I, I, it makes me very hopeful. Yeah, and, and I think on a college campus, there are so many teachable moments but they're not necessarily just from the teachers, or if we only think of the professors as the teachers, then we're being very narrow. Um, and so, for instance, uh, I'll give you an anecdote that uh, in, in my Medieval Europe II course, I was talking about uh, the Crusades, what makes the Holy Land holy, and, and, and students have this image of the Middle Ages as you know, Christians and Jews fighting all the time, Christians, Jews, and Muslims fighting all the time, that's part of the story. The other part of the story is just the remarkable intellectual exchange that took place among artisans and among philosophers and things like that. 
but you have to be open to the other. And so I told the story of Muhammad's night journey and um, a woman slammed her hand on the table and she said, that's ridiculous. And I lost my filter. And I said, I, I believe a dead guy came back to life. Now that's ridiculous. And, and, and I think it just kind of, you know, it, it diffused this. And I don't know, I didn't plan on saying that, uh, but it just kind of diffused the situation, you know, to, to the, the problem I think is that is that people approach interfaith dialogue sometimes not as dialogue, but as monologue, right? Um, and so we're not going to convince each, there are fundamental differences in doctrine, as you said at the beginning. Why would I begin with what we disagree with when I can begin with with where we where we are you know, right together and what what we share and so I, I one of the things that I think a, a college campus is rather good at or any you know learning setting is good at is it is a little humility why do I why does why do I think my faith is right and here's a bigger question why must I believe that my faith is right why can't all the faiths be right, each in their own way. And I'm not going to convince you that Jesus is the Son of God. Why would I do that? I don't want to do that. But but where do we share that message? You know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or even the reverse, don't do unto others. You know, that's you could believe that without believing anything metaphysical or spiritual at all. It just kind of makes sense and i think that we we're, we're losing that i, I think we're losing common great as an american i think we're losing the the unum in e pluribus unum we're, we're losing the, the 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 bond that we are the united um states of america and i think religion which is people are so afraid to talk about can divide but it can also unite and so i i this may be going into the next question i'm sorry mohammed but i'm but when you're, I'm going to ask the young people here the question that I ask myself when I'm putting together a panel at a conference: Who's not here? Who who didn't I invite? And how can I fix that? Very good points. Very good point. And last question here uh, before we open it up to public: Is how can people overcome differences and disagreement in order to have positive and fruitful relationships with those of other faiths and background? How can we respect each other while acknowledging that we do not have to always agree? Well, I think there are actually two questions in there. Um, I'll, I'll begin with a quote from um, Prophet Muhammad's uh, son-in-law and his cousin, Imam Ali, والسلام, who said, uh, people are of two types, either your brother in religion or your equal in creation. Um, and with that said, you know, of course, uh, overcoming differences and disagreements in order to have positive and fruitful relationship. Um, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, many ways of achieving that. Uh, number one, I think, uh, listen actively. Um, active listening is essential for building positive relationships when engaging in dialogue with people of other faiths and make sure you listen carefully to what they are saying ask questions and try to understand their perspective um, and focus on similarities um, although there may be differences between religions it is important to focus on those similar grounds the shared values as we highlighted before as well by identifying common ground people can easily relate to one another and of course foster this understanding and if there are any differences that you come with uh, walk into this uh, interfaith dialogue and you already have pre-assumed pre-assumptions um you know respect the differences it is important to focus on similarities it is also essential to respect the differences that we have uh, as individuals to each, each other you know even within one faith you might find differences between two people um, under one roof, you'll find differences between husband and wife and different relatives and whatnot. So people should acknowledge and honor the unique beliefs and practices of others, even if they do not agree with them. Um, and avoid stereotype assumptions 
um, I remember once I was invited to a you know similar gathering um, at a Christian church in Boston, and uh, majority was students, but there are of course uh, some um, elderly from the community as well, and it was an open uh, question time, and then this uh, gentleman uh, who was probably at that time you know seventy five plus, and he asked a question which you know of course could be enraging as a believer of uh, um, you know islamic faith that first thing that he questioned was was muhammad a warmonger that he went to all these wars and he was you know he always wanted to you know engage into war and criminal activities and of course you know i'm sitting there and how do i address this um, and I realized that his motive was not to drive me up and to, you know, get under my skin or something, but was to be able to give an answer response that a lot of the things that we hear and see on TV and media may not be absolutely correct. Or even if they're presented, they're presented from that one perspective, which is not, um, you know, explaining the real side of it. So, so avoid stereotypes, even if you know some of these things behind your back, because you may not know the real answer to these questions. You know, of course, all we are taught about Islam, um, since if you are a product, if you're born after 9-11, then uh, right away, you can easily equate the word jihad uh, with terrorism right away. And wherever you hear the word jihad or jihadist or Islamist or any of those words, um, you know, right away, you can sit, think or imagine that where this is headed, you know, what direction are we going to be talking about and what is to come in the news. So, um, you know, the making these assumptions, actually, we should avoid making assumptions uh, about other, other faiths. Uh, be open to learning. People should be open to learning about other religions and cultures. This can be done through reading, attending events, uh, engaging in dialogue like this with people of other faiths. Um, and, you know, I'll conclude that, you know, be mindful of language and tone. Um, sometimes you say certain things um, about other people's faith loosely where it might be really, um, you know, it, it could offend them. Um, and, um, you know, the whole discussion with the freedom of speech that comes about with the, the cartoons and the caricatures that are, you know, drawn and someone uh, makes a depiction of uh, Prophet Muhammad or makes depiction of other biblical figures, for example, it is uh, it could be taken aback. So the language and the tone that people use when discussing religion um, can have a significant impact on the quality of their relationship with those of other faiths. So people should be mindful of the language that they use, avoiding language, which is, of course, derogatory and uh, and offensive i know i've taken more time but i have some other uh in this which hopefully i'll get a chance to discuss as well thank you Rizwan. um so again very very eloquently but um i think that when one enters into interfaith dialogue it's important to remember that it is not a winner take all event right um it's not a competition um, we're here to learn about each other and learn from each other. Um, and I think it's it's important to go into it with um, an attitude of inquisitiveness, um, to to be fascinated by how others um, live their lives and and what others believe in. Um, and I think that we I think it's it, it if we go in with that attitude, um, we can engage in very respectful dialogues. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've been led to believe that interfaith dialogue is, is risky business, um, but it's not. If anything else, if anything, we find that we walk away from these conversations with a great sense of satisfaction, um, that we, we've learned a lot, we've, we've made new connections. Um, so I don't, I don't think that it is a, a landmine that we sometimes are led to believe that it is. I think there are many great opportunities to, to have these conversations and each one um, is another opportunity to learn more, to learn from others, to learn about others. Um, and, you know, as, as you know, as Rizwan pointed out that, you know, no two people are alike, you know, in Judaism, we have a saying, um, two Jews, three synagogues. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, um, uh, so, you know, there's, there's always a difference of opinion. Um, and it's uh, even among Jews, you know, you can have a conversation with me as a reform rabbi and have a very different conversation with an Orthodox rabbi. Um, and I think that just adds to, to the many dimensions that interfaith dialogue um, presents for us. Thank you so much. I think this this concludes our questions, but I see our few takeaways are that we need to have more of these interfaith dialogues. We need to include our youth. Uh, we need to start talking about differences. We need to learn about each other's religion. We need to promote uh, each other and support each other in, in bringing peace into our community. And we need to promote being human and loving each other. Um, if you want to add couple of lines here before I open it up to public. All right, thank you so much. So I'm gonna open it up to public. Um, what I would request everyone is if you could please raise your hand, um, uh, digital hand, that would be great. And we'll pick um, the people. And uh, if you, I know some people are shy in, in talking. If you're shy, please type your question in and we'll ask that question for you. It is a great opportunity to ask. If you don't want to ask for yourself, ask for your friend, family. These these uh, things, these interfaith uh, panel panels will happen more at Kane. But for now, this is your opportunity. I think our panelists did a great job. Oh, we have a question here. All right, question is for, for any of the panelists, whoever wants to answer, what's a tradition or practice from your faith that you think those in other faith would find interesting but might not know much about? So what, uh, Sarah, if it's okay, what I would do is I will ask everyone this question. This is an interesting question and a good question. So let's ask everyone and we'll start from my top right because on top left, it's me, uh, Rabbi Victor. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. So um, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I think that, um, you know, like all of the like uh, other religions that um, are represented here, we all come from deep traditions of ritual observance. Um, and uh, each each one of us have those. So I actually wanted to mention something that um, people might know a little bit about, but not a lot about but also bear some similarities to a practice in Christianity, which would be, um, you know, in, in Christian tradition, there is a practice of uh, communion, of wine and uh, a wafer or bread. Um, and we actually have something that is similar, even though it has an entirely different meaning, right? So we make uh, a blessing called Kiddush over wine. Um, and at uh, our Sabbath meal, we eat a special braided bread, which you may be familiar, called challah. Um, so, so these are things that resemble something that you may see in other faiths, but for us, the meaning is entirely different. So for us, the Kiddush is a, the sweet wine is a symbol of sweetness and joy. Um, we are celebrating both the work of creation and our ability to rest and our redemption from slavery. And the bread is a reminder of the way we are um, sustained by God. Um, so uh, what may appear to some people as something similar, which I love, um, has a very different meaning, which I love equally. <laughs> I'll go down to my, my right, Dr. Bolito. Um, well, I think it's the multiplicity of bread and wine. Catholics believe that the bread and wine are made transformed into the body and blood of Jesus, which is why the Romans uh, 2,000 years ago referred to the earliest Christians as cannibals. Um, different Christian churches believe different things. Uh, Lutherans believe in something called consubstantiation, that the bread and wine become the body and blood when the community is gathered together, but when the community disperses, it goes back to being bread and wine, and other groups think that it's just um, a, a, a symbol 
without a transformation. So there is quite a multiplicity of beliefs about the bread and wine um, among Christians as well. And whereas people think of even Catholicism as being very monolithic, there is a Latin Western expression of Christianity, European based. But Christianity began in the Greek East. Jesus did not, as most of my confreres in grammar school thought, speak Italian um, or English. Uh, but Aramaic, um, and um, so there's an expression in the Greek East, the Byzantine Church, the Ukrainian Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, and then Presbyterians, Methodists, and then Amish and Shakers and Quakers. Um, and so I think that there is a uh, quite a diversity of Christian expressions of belief in Jesus um, that that belie the notion of a of a monolith. More one or one? Yeah, I'll stick with uh, stay with the the foods and drinking and all that in the tradition as well. You know, we have the month of Ramadan coming, and I'm sure everyone knows what we do during the month of Ramadan. So I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, prior to leading up to month of Ramadan, uh, the um, um, so the month of Ramadan, then you have uh, is the ninth month in the Islamic calendar year, so eighth and the seventh month. Uh, Rajab and Shaban, respectively, um, are the two months where you'd find in typical Muslim uh, congregations or communities, especially the Shia Muslim communities, that there's a lot of emphasis, which is not an obligation to, and a lot of recommendation, you know, to invite people to your house for a feast. Um, you know, there are different names to this thing, which is, for example, Niaz or Nadr or Kunde, and different words are used for uh, these, uh, you know, these invitations. And you don't invite, you know, like 10 people or 15 people or 20 people. You just have an open invitation to as many as you want. Uh, Sometimes people just post even in the in our mosque, you know, it's an open invitation to our house on this particular day from one o'clock till six o'clock and come. And so, of course, people knew. And back home, if you refer to some of these, uh, you know, people who come from um, from Lucknow, India and uh, other places like that, they mentioned that, you know, this niyaz, this uh, serving was something which was done start from the morning time. People didn't go to their the other houses to, you know, really fill their bellies and eat up a lot. They would just go there to taste and then move to the next house. They'll taste and we'll go to the third house and the fourth house and the fifth house. And all day long, they'll just, you know, of course, it'll be on a weekend, so they don't have to go to work or anything. All day long, they'll be going from one house to another house, just tasting food as they've been invited to do so, um, not eating a whole meal, for example. So I think this is something which is interesting, not known to many outside of the Muslim, and especially the Shia Muslim culture, uh, to have these sort of uh, gatherings uh, are primarily done at people's houses and not even at the house of worship. So the two months of Rajab and Shaban, interestingly enough, um, you know, offer that. One thing that I feel that it's common in all the religions, especially representing here, it's food. We all want to eat a lot. So, so that's good, right? All right. So we have a couple of more questions. Uh, we have Mahin Shah asking for any panelist, what is the, what is the best thing that keeps you anchored in your faith? Very good question. Uh, can I go first? Absolutely. I, I so I I am a, a Catholic whose field is church history, and sometimes people will apologize to me when they're about to criticize the church, and I always respond, "Get in line. I I I know a lot more that I could criticize than you would ever know in your entire life." And I think I'm more critical, I think, because I don't want to be charged with having my scholarship colored by my, by my belief. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it, there's a comfort in faith. There's a comfort in, so people will say to me, Dr. B, you have a PhD. How can you believe all this stuff, this miracle stuff and this Jesus resurrection stuff? How can you believe that? And, and I always say, because I choose to believe that, right? So. So I, I, I know that if I jump off a 10-story building, it is, incredible, it is very likely that I will die. But I put that in my being in the world of science, and I put Jesus in the world of 
faith. And, and I choose to believe that. And I find that very helpful because I, in the Middle, in the middle Ages, there was this wonderful, it's a Jewish, it's a Muslim, it's a Christian um, notion of learned ignorance. That no matter how much you know about God, whatever you call God, you'll never know all of it. And there's a very famous guy in the 15th, 15th century in the 1400s who says, who says, God's a circle and we're a polygon. And no matter how much that polygon gets close to the circle, it'll never be a circle. And it is at that point that you just have to say, that's as far as I can go. I find that very liberating. liberating. I find that very comforting. Any other response from Rabbi or Molina? I, I think for me, it's this um, concept, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, that we in Judaism call tikkun olam. And that means the repairing of the world. Um, and the way we understand it is that um, the world is a little incomplete or broken um, right now. Because when God created the world, God did not finish the work of creation. So it is up to each of us in partnership to, to work toward um, that, that completion of the world. We do that by, by acts of study, by acts of charity, by acts of loving kindness by social justice work. And so I think that keeps me really anchored because it means that um, my work will never be, my work as a Jew, forget that I'm a rabbi, my work as a Jew, my work as a person of faith will never be complete. There will always be something more for me to do. And that I work in partnership with God. Um, and that to me is, is anchoring, it's grounding and, and it's comforting. Um, so that I think is what keeps me, um, invested on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Any other response? I think they've covered everything pretty much. Yes. All right. So we'll ask the next question from Iram, Iram Fatima. Please shed a little light on similarities and differences in Quran and Bible. And how do we address that with interfaith forums? It's for anyone, so. You know, there was a, a workshop that we had done um, in the past, and I, and for that reason, I opened up my uh, my documents just because I knew there would be something like that, um, that we had done between similarities between Islam and Christianity. And then we had done another one uh, with, uh, with Islam and Judaism. Uh, so a lot of the teachings of Bible and the teachings of Quran, you know, there was uh, this comparison done, for example, regarding one God. Um, you know, you find in Isaiah 43, 10 to 13, you know, God says, I am the one. Before me, no God was formed. After me, there has been no other. I, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. And you find similar in chapter 112, uh, one of the smaller chapters of Quran, uh, it says, um, prophets say um, he is only God. God is absolute. Um, you know, he neither begets nor was he begotten. There is no one equal to him. Um, you know, there's fascination as to how similar these verses are, um, both, um, you know, different scriptures, but of course, coming from uh, Abrahamic faith. Um, similarly, you know, what did Quran say about Jesus? As uh, I think Dr. mentioned earlier in the beginning, that when he's teaching his class, he mentions how much more mention of Jesus is done in Quran than it is in Bible itself. Or I can say the same thing about uh, Prophet Moses, that Moses is the is the, the prophet who is mentioned the most in Quran. Um, 131 times, I believe, is uh, the name Moses has appeared, while Muhammad is mentioned only four times. Um, so it will seem like, you know, it's more Jew Jewish book than, than an Islamic book, for, if that was the criterion. But uh, so, you know, there, there are a lot of similar similarities from that aspect, uh, um, you know, greetings in each religion, um, you know, how we say peace be with you, we similarly say in, 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 in our culture, assalamu alaikum, 
or for example, you know, shalom, shalom alaikum. Um, all of these, um, of course, are pretty um, basic things. And there are other stuff that is also more advanced, which is, um, you know, could be compared between different faiths. But these are some of the examples that come to mind. Any other comments? Okay, so the next question is from Lucia. Uh, thinking of who is not at the table today, what could student people who are not sure what faith they believe or what they believe in, if anything at all, take from this conversation today? None of us is finished. Um, my faith at 57 is very different than my faith at 27 is very different than my faith at seven. Um, when I was a boy, I had a fascination with Judaism because um, my mother gave me the novels of Chaim Potok to read. And there was a tradition of, of this respect for learning, this respect for the book that I didn't find in my own Christian upbringing, though I grew up in one of those houses where books were all over the place. Um, and we read all the time. Um, and so I was drawn to Judaism through these books. And it was through that that I realized in high school, I took a church history course when I was a junior in high school, that I didn't even realize that the church had a history until I took that course. So my entry into Christian history was actually through Judaism. And though I never thought I'm going to convert to Christianity, excuse me, to Judaism, I did think, wow, it would be really cool to be a rabbi. Um, or, or, or to go that path of study. And then in college, and then especially in graduate school, you're getting a degree in medieval history. Um, I had that same feeling in the Islamic tradition. So I would say, find your entry point, being unafraid that, oh my goodness, if I'm Muslim and I read Christian authors, I'll be Christian. Or you know, fill in the, you know, do any of those versions of the read, read in an unafraid manner. Read to read and encounter and go to movies blah, 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 um, with an open mind that you can encounter all of those things and remain true to who you are. And I would argue you will even become more of who you are, not because you say, "Well, I heard their stuff and." No, I'm right. They're wrong. Not, that's not what I'm saying. It is, is, is you become, the more you read among many faiths, but these three monotheistic faiths, you realize the interconnectedness of it because there is no other way to look at the three faiths other than the interconnectedness, you know, un unless you're closed minded. Any other response? I just think that, um, you know, if you're not sure what you believe in, or if you don't have a faith tradition, just, you know, life is a journey. <clears throat> and we don't always know where it's going to take us. But I think the most important thing is to be open to wherever it will take us. Um, and uh, to know that, you know, all of these faiths here today, and so many others, represent wonderful ways of, of life. Um, wonderful belief systems, wonderful practices. Um, and, you know, I, I always encourage people who are sort of on this journey to, to make as many stops along the way as possible. Um, and they'll know it when they get there. Um, and uh, yes, I too read um, Chaim Potok's <laughs> books when I was a kid. In, in, in my neighborhood, it was required reading. <laughs> Any other response? Yeah, I just wanted to add to a wonderful responses. Anything that we can take from this conversation today, I think um, um, all the panelists uh, hit upon this, that you know uh, we, we should be open-minded, um, approach discussions with an open mind, being willing to consider new ideas and perspectives, um, You know, agree to disagree, right? It is okay to have different opinions on certain issues. Uh, people can agree, to disagree and still maintain a respectful relationship. 
um, uh, this involves recognizing that differences of opinion do not necessarily mean a lack of respect or understanding. And I think lastly, the takeaway could be focus on the bigger picture. Uh, when differences arise, uh, people should try to focus on the bigger picture and uh, the shared goals um, they are working towards. By focusing on these shared goals, uh, people can maintain a positive and a constructive relationship, even when they don't agree on everything uh, that is being said. So while it is religious-based interfaith dialogue, even if you don't subscribe to any of these religions, but I think what you can take away from today's discussion is uh, the, um, you know, these these um, attributes that you you can remain positive even without following any of these religions. All right, we have one more question from Basim Jaffer. Uh, what what future do you envision for interfaith dialogue apart from events? What more can we do at our places of worship to welcome people from different faiths to come? All right. Uh, I, I can just say that, so down here, I'm in Monmouth County, and in this area, there is the Freehold Area Clergy Association or some such. Uh, Names. And they have a Children of Abraham series. And so what they do four or five times a year is they pick a topic. So it might be scripture in our tradition. And then two months later, it might be food in our tradition or fill in the blank in our tradition. And the three or four panelists, it the site rotates. So it's not only that you're listening, but you are she was saying the experience of the place of bringing people into a mosque bringing people into a temple so part of the program is the discussion but part of it is hey have you ever ne never been in a mosque this is this and this is that and this is the other um and and there's something about going to someone's house right so i i, I think that that there's a combination there's hospitality there's place and then there's the topic of the evening Any other response? I think that, you know, as um, Dr. Belito said, you know, um, interfaith councils, um, local interfaith councils, which clergy often have the opportunity to be part of, are real catalysts for creating this interfaith dialogue and these exchanges. Um, here in Westfield, for example, we actually had just a couple of weeks ago our, our first um, tour of different houses of worship. So a group of people started here at our temple and then went to a couple of different churches in town, learning a little bit about the history of that um, building, of that faith, um, and their relationship to the town. And we will often do things with um, our high school students, taking them to uh, other uh, houses of worship to, to visit, to experience services, just as we welcome the you know, high school classes and confirmation classes of the neighboring churches here in town to our services. So these are, you know, these are great opportunities. And, you know, um, I think it's, you know, for those of us who lead houses of worship, it's, it's, it's on us. It's incumbent upon us to, to create those opportunities and to, to make sure that we're opening our doors to, to everyone. Any other response? All right, the next question is uh, from Mahin Shah again to all the par par panelists. What does it mean to really depend on or trust God in your individual faith? I can go first because I, I didn't answer the last question, I guess. Um, <laughs> Well, this is a very interesting question. I don't think um, the time will be do justice to it. Um, um, you know, there's a whole discussion on theology, basically. Uh, it's a theological question. And I'll just say it in, in the try and summarize in, in less than a minute, that what does it mean for you to trust someone, uh, rely on someone in your house, right? So you grow up in your house, you know, with a fatherly figure, with a mother, with um, you know, older siblings. And when you rely upon them, you trust them. 
um, you know, and different people that you come across uh, that you trust in your life. Um, it is possible that, you know, your father will definitely be that person that support, which will continue to support you, good or bad, he'll support you. Um, and you can always rely upon him and you can always trust him. Um, and Islamic faith goes further beyond. And similarly, when it comes to your mom, right, you trust her, you rely upon her, many things you can count on them for their support and all that stuff. Just uh, multiply that by, um, you know, whatever. And that's how much trust we have in our God uh, that we believe in him, that uh, even it might happen that for some reason, your father or your mother or your loved ones may not be able to provide that reliance that you need. But God's always there. Um, that support, that reliance, and that trust is always there. There's no despair there. There's no, um, you know, losing hope in in God's trust. Yes, what you ask for may not be given right away um, because it is for your own good. Um, you know, a lot of time I get these questions from younger folks that, you know, I'm very uh, practicing and I, you know, I attend all the services and I do all the obligations and I've been good and all that stuff, but still, you know, I'm not where I want. And I ask all of these supplications, make all these supplications, but I still don't think they're being correctly answered or I haven't really received. Um, so yes, the fact that, you know, you're breathing, the fact that you're talking, the fact that you're able to, um, you know, breathe the air and you're able to communicate that itself is a, a trust from God given to you, uh, let alone everything else that you ask in your life. So just in a abridged version, concise and summary for that. Any other response? So, Rabbi? I'll just briefly say that um, one of the things that I cherish most about Judaism is that um, we are monotheistic, but mon but not monolithic, uh, meaning that um, <clears throat> there are any number of <clears throat> ways to think about God, um, from being very internal to being very external. Um, you know, um, part of the reason uh, that we don't um, have images of God is because um, we each have our own image of God. Um, and so I think that for, you know, for individuals, you know, there are some people who believe that God is um, intimately involved with their lives and, and will um, respond to, uh, to their requests. And there are others that believe, you know, God has sort of set the world in motion and it's, it's more up to us to answer our own prayers than to expect them to be answered for us. Um, so I love that there are so many different ways of, of approaching this, this question, which is a really great question. Um, and I, I, I think that each of us um, has to kind of come to that uh, answer on their own. Um, I can't tell someone um, how to trust on God or trust in God or even what that means. Um, I think that's something that we each um, uh, develop on our own. And I also think that that relationship that we have with God um, changes over over time um, and uh, evolves. And I, I I will uh, uh, confess, admit, uh, I have quite a volatile relationship with God, um, and and there have been times in my life where the Bronx has really come out, um, and and. Uh, I think because it's such a long-standing relationship, um, it's it's very. I don't want to use the word friend because it's such a cliche and it, it, it kind of conjures up this gooey Jesus thing that I don't like, right? But you know, I have you know the longest relationships that I have in, in my life are with my brothers and my parents. My father now gone to God, um, and that relationship has changed. This is the points that that my conferences have made, right? And and it ebbs and it flows and there's there's kisses and there's hugs and there's yelling um and i am very comfortable going on a long walk and telling god that i really think god messed up this time and that god doesn't know what's going on and i'm not going to talk to you for a couple of days um 
and my image of that relationship again to use to use a, a, a piece of Jewish um, uh, culture is uh, so you may know last week um, uh, a, a, an Israeli actor by the name of Chaim Topol died, and Topol played Tevya, the lead character of um, Fiddler on the Roof, so many times in his career that it, he said on a talk show once, and I don't know whether he was serious or joking, that on his income tax form where it said profession, he wrote Tevya. Um, and and the thing about Tevya, if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, is that he's constantly talking to God. There's no like, oh, this is my prayer time. You know, it, it's it's he's milking his cow. He's a dairy farmer. He's milking his cows. He's yelling at his kids, and and he looks at God. And he looks. You know, he's always looking up, right? He looks at God, and he says, oh, "What are you doing? This can't be right." And and I that really sustains me that I can do that, that I can say that, and I know that God's not going to stop talking to me. Uh, I may stop listening for a while, but um, there is that sense of. You know, and I, I think I really learned about this through, um, uh, I, I say that I'm married to my best friend because I know, it, like my mom, like my dad when he was around, that I can say anything. And if I'm being a jerk, they're going to tell me, you're really being a jerk. But it's out of love. It's exactly what what um, we were hearing earlier. It's, it's use the model of your mother or your father or your whoever is in your house or your best friend or whatever. And uh, there is that element that you could just say it and walk away and the relationship's not going to be broken. I find that very satisfying. Very good. I think we are almost at the end. Um, I have a question here that I think well, we, we all feel sometimes, or sometimes most of the time that we can ask question to other people just because we don't want to offend them. Uh, so what is the safe way to ask a question or is there a safe way? I think that um, a great way to begin a conversation um, uh, and learning about someone else's faith tradition is to simply start by saying, I would love to learn more about, can you tell me, right? Not why do you believe this or why do you do that, which, you know, can come across as um, judgmental, even if we don't mean it to. Um, and I think we've all, you know, talked a little bit about, you know, the language that we use. So I think, you know, I, I'd love to be honest, be genuine. I'd love to learn a little bit more. Can you tell me? Um, is a great way to to engage in that dialogue in a very respectful and open-minded way. Awesome. All right. I think we have uh, reached, we still have some time, uh, but there are no more questions. And I think that was a great, great panel discussion. Uh, we we discuss a lot of great questions. So thank you again to everyone, uh, our panelists, uh, everyone in our audience. I wish we were in person so we could see each other and be with uh, with each other. Um, HRC Kane says, really amazing program. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to put your comments in, please do put it in. Uh, I'll leave it as an open discussion kind where you leave your comments or you just open up your mic, speak, just like we would have done when we were in public. If you want to leave, please leave. Um, Mimi said, thank you very much. Um, now the session, the program has ended. Thank you all so much for doing this. I agree. We should have these more often. Police. And again, nobody has to stay. It's just an open forum right now. If you're willing, please leave. Uh, our panelists are here. Uh, I got them. I'm not 